Okay, so I would like to start off with a uh, big picture question about uh, the U.S. establishment and uh, the group think. You speak a lot of truth about the U.S. foreign policy and geopolitics. Now, one might say that should not be surprising because uh, the U.S. has freedom of speech and many smart people. So theoretically, there should be a lot of Jeffrey Sachs. But if you uh, look at uh, the media, think tanks, academics, politicians, etc., they all repeat the same narrative like zombies. And uh, this is not even being patriotic since they are fooling themselves with uh, delusional propaganda. So my question to you is, why is the situation so tragic and what can be done to fix it? Well, thank you very much. You know, there has uh, always been a lot of grandiosity in American thinking from, from the founding of uh, the United States, uh, even before the United States, from the founding of the British colonies in North America. Uh, the uh, founders viewed themselves as very special, and they viewed their colonial settlements as very special, uh, a kind of gift to the world. And uh, in the 19th century, the famous expression was manifest destiny, a providential destiny uh, for the English-speaking uh, settlers on the east coast of North America, the founders of the United States, to conquer all of North America. And there were a lot of people there, a lot of uh, indigenous uh, nations. Uh, so there was a lot of genocide, a lot of warfare, all in the name of God, I have to say. So this was, a, this, this was a grandiose exceptionalism. Uh, when the U.S. Uh, completed its continental conquest at the end of the 1890s, it looked around the world and said, well, Europe has all these empires. It's time for us to uh, have an empire as well abroad. And so the U.S. concocted a war with the uh, waning Spanish empire, the war uh, of 1898, the Spanish-American War, and uh, America grabbed uh, colonies uh, in the Caribbean and the Philippines. Uh, this uh, began America's global venture. Uh, when the European disastrous civil war we call World War I uh, ended, the European uh, imperial powers were still standing, but they were weakened. The Great Depression uh, of the 1920s and 1930s weakened them further. The second European civil war, uh, which we call World War II, essentially ended the European empires. And at the end of World War II, uh, the uh, American leaders said, hey, this is our world now. Uh, in fact, uh, Henry Luce, the publisher of uh, Time uh, in 1941, uh, gave the slogan, uh, the American century. This really went to the heads of the Americans. I have to say they loved the idea. This was our world centuries. There's been a Mongol century. There's been uh, British hegemony. Now it's America's turn to run the world. Of course, uh, the world quickly divided into two parts, uh, the U.S. Uh, and the Soviet-led world. Uh, many, many uh, newly independent countries said, we don't want either of them. We want to be non-aligned. But nonetheless, two nuclear superpowers battled it out in many proxy wars. When the Soviet Union ended in December 1991, the U.S. grandiosity was then complete uh, because now the rival was gone. The U.S. could see itself as the sole superpower as far as the eye could see. They didn't even take notice of China at the time, which was just, uh, as they imagined, uh, a nation of rice growing villages. You know, it was uh, not even something on the radar screen. Of course, not India, of course, uh, uh, not uh, other parts of the world. Russia looked crushed. So the U.S. Uh, denominated itself as the indispensable nation, the world's sole superpower, the greatest power in the history of the world, greater than the Roman Empire, and on and on and on. I heard a lot of that uh, going through my ears uh, from the 1990s onward. I think what was different for me 
as an individual was that I was a practitioner of development economics. My perspective was always not the U.S., but poor countries that were trying to figure out what to do with themselves so that they could uh, develop economically. And I was always looking at the United States from outside in. And I often didn't like what I saw. And especially from the 1990s onward, I really disliked what I saw. And it got worse and worse uh, with the regime change, uh, wars of choice, uh, NATO enlargement, uh, abandoning nuclear arms agreements uh, such as the anti-ballistic missile treaty which the u.s unilaterally abandoned in 2002 and the uh, intermediate nuclear force treaty which the u.s unilaterally abandoned in 2019 and so forth and so uh, as my own life uh, uh, progressed with more and more experience internationally and as the u.s grandiosity which we call neo no con thinking or neo conservative thinking progressed. I became really uh, <laughs> a, a vocal uh, uh, detester of what I saw as American arrogance, and I think the time abroad, uh, which is nearly <laughs> around the year, uh, was uh, definitely part of that. Now I have to say there there are many uh, aspects of this American thinking. But one is a uh, famous expression of uh, one of our writers, uh, Sinclair Lewis, who, who said uh, it's impossible to convince a person of something when their job uh, believes in believing the opposite. So there are a lot of people that are on hire. Uh, the American uh, security state has uh, its reach everywhere. It's a trillion dollar direct security operation, but it goes well beyond that in terms of lobbying uh, in terms of the financial reach of uh, American uh, big industry, especially big oil, which plays a, a major role in the strategic uh, uh, settings of, of uh, U.S. policy. So the East Coast think tanks, which I've been uh, part of, uh, Brookings Institution, Council on Foreign Relations, and so forth, are all pretty deeply enmeshed uh, in the U.S. security state. And that leads to a lot of groupthink. It leads to a lot of uh, a repetition of the U.S. narrative. The most amazing thing about the U.S. narrative is not that the U.S. Uh, neocons debate the rest of the world. It's that they ignore the rest of the world. This is how it really works. We just don't hear any uptake of debate on issues such as uh, how did the Ukraine war start? Uh, why did it start? Who blew up uh, the Nord Stream pipeline? Uh, or issues like that. There's no debate in the power centers. There's a narrative. And if there's a counter narrative, it's simply ignored. It's not refuted. It's not debated. It's not taken on and qualified. It's simply ignored. This is uh, quite interesting. It makes you feel very strange. <laughs> like you say things and they just go out into, uh, in, in, into the, 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 midst, the mist. But uh, that's how it works. I finally realized no one wants to debate. Uh, people just uh, make their assertions. The White House states its facts as it wants them to be believed. And that's the end of the story. Of course, most of the world doesn't believe this narrative because they see things with their own eyes. But Washington doesn't care. The idea is to proceed, not to win hearts and minds, not to convince anybody, just to proceed. This is a matter of power. Uh, that's what this is about. It's a matter of self-proclaimed exceptionalism. Uh, it's a matter of self-proclaimed hegemony. It's all delusional, it's dangerous, it's expensive, it's not working, but that's where we are. Wow, wow. That was a great explanation, yeah. So uh, the only way to fix it is if uh, the U.S. Uh, uh, loses its power a little bit and then uh, the wisdom will uh, slowly come in? Well, I think what's happening is... Uh, I've decided, look, it's it's not really worth arguing. Are we in a unipolar world as Joe Biden now in his reveries uh, and, and uh, imagination of, of the 1990s believes? 
or are we in a multipolar world? We're in a multipolar world. There's no doubt uh, China, Russia, India. Uh, these are separate uh, great powers. There's no question about it. Uh, the U.S. doesn't know that or understand that. Uh, the U.S. tells itself fables uh, every day. Oh, we're still in charge. We're still the number one. We lead the free world. Whatever, whatever is said. But the fact is we're already in a multipolar world. Now, this is a dangerous world when you have one of the superpowers that says it's unipolar and the rest say, well, no, not exactly. Uh, the U.S. says we get to put NATO where we want, including in Ukraine. Russia says, well, no, not exactly. Uh, the U.S. says we get to arm Taiwan no matter what China says. China says, well, no, not exactly. So we have a, a growing clash between what I would consider to be American delusions and the ground reality. Now, that's very dangerous. Uh, it has created an open war in Ukraine. It could create uh, an open, uh, even more dangerous war uh, between the U.S. and China over Taiwan. We have our generals that talk openly about this, even though it's worse than a nightmare. It's You can't even imagine how disastrous this would be for the world and for the U.S., but it's talked about openly as if it's kind of a board game or a video game. So the world's dangerous because of this ongoing delusion, but we're already in a multipolar world. Now, what to do about it? To my mind, it's to help the U.S. out of its delusions peacefully, calmly, uh, but clearly. No, you can't do that. No, the world doesn't agree with you. No, you don't really lead the whole world. And uh, I like to count numbers for uh, my fellow Americans. The U.S. population is 335 million people. Europe's population is 450 million people in the EU. So that's about 800 million people. Add in Britain, uh, add in Japan, uh, Australia, New Zealand, Korea. You know, you're, you're maybe at... Uh, uh, depending on exactly who you include, at a billion to 1.2 billion people out of 8 billion. Well, it's not so impressive. You're between 10 and 15 percent of the world population. You know, uh, the other 85 percent are scratching their heads and saying, what is going on? We don't want this war in Ukraine. We don't want a war in Asia. We don't want American unilateral sanctions. Of course, we still have if, if you want to talk about fantasy world, the U.S. is delusional, but Britain is completely a fantasy land because they still think they're an empire. They're yeah, 60 million people in a mess on the island of uh, Britain, in a mess. But they talk like, oh, we're going to beat the Russians in Ukraine. And yes, we do this and we do that. So that's really imperial uh, nostalgia and delusion. And so the question is, can this be brought down in time to actually make peace and even better than that cooperation to solve some very, very big problems? Because the world is beset not only by these direct conflicts, but by terrible environmental crises and many other crises that need to be addressed in a cooperative way. And we put aside all that cooperation. Uh, you know, these uh, so-called American leaders, they don't talk about the UN. They don't talk about global goals. They don't talk about the Paris Climate Agreement. We don't hear about any of this. We just hear about Russia and China and how the free world has to confront the authoritarian world and, and so on. So we're not hearing about any global problem solving right now. And of course, we're standing shoulder to shoulder with genocide uh, caused by, led by Israel right now. So it's, it's a quite huge mess. But my thought about this, honestly, is the vast majority of the world wants something different. It should really remain calm, not meet the U.S. with its counter delusions, but just remain calm and say we believe in international law, in the United Nations, in the UN Charter, in the General Assembly, in the UN Security Council, in the International Court of Justice, in the ICC and others. Let's make that system work because that's the only one 
that can give us some security that we stay alive and avoid a great power conflict that could end the world. Hmm. So, um, okay. So I'm trying to figure out what is uh, going through the minds of the blobs, you know, the uh, uh, the State Department, uh, the Pentagon, the CIA, and uh, Wall Street, and all those people. So, uh, do they really believe what they're saying, or they're just uh, bluffing like a uh, a card game? A, a little bit of both, and I. I think because I try to figure out that uh, answer, uh, the answer to that question as well. And of course, they don't tell me their innermost thoughts, so I have to uh, infer them. But part of it is a, a bit bureaucratic, which is that decisions taken back in the 1990s still remain the policy today. Uh, and this is true as administrations come and go. Basically, when the Soviet Union ended, the United States policy, grand strategy, if you want to give it a big name, was we will be the unipolar power. We will expand NATO. Then as China rose, we will surround China uh, with uh, our military in Japan, Korea, in parts of Southeast Asia, in Australia, New Zealand, and so forth. And these are deep strategies. They're not changed uh, year to year, even administration to administration, and they are decidedly not changed by my op-eds, you know? So uh, they're not thinking day to day to reanalyze this. They are carrying out a plan. Zbig Brzezinski, uh, who was very clever and very influential, uh, wrote in 1997 in Foreign Affairs magazine, the magazine of the Council on Foreign Relations, a piece called A, uh, a Strategy for Eurasia. And it laid out a 15-year plan for NATO enlargement, including saying that between 2005 and 2010, Ukraine would come in assuming that it met the criteria and so forth. 2008 turned out to be the year in which Ukraine was invited to NATO membership, though without a specific roadmap. To my mind, that's indicative. Brzezinski's article was 1997. It reflected already Washington thinking of several years. So it probably reflected a kind of consensus from 1993 or 1994. It was collected and presented in 1997, and you could see it playing out for the next 15 years. In other words, this is pretty deeply entrained. And the project to bring NATO uh, to Ukraine or Ukraine as a member of NATO, I think is essentially uh, almost a 30-year project. And the, the way that Bluff came in was the U.S. figured it would invite Ukraine and Russia objected, but so what? And so it would just move forward. And then things got in the way. And one thing that got in the way was President Viktor Yanukovych, who was elected in 2010, and he wanted neutrality for Ukraine. He represented the ethnic Russians uh, in the East. And most Ukrainians at the time wanted neutrality. They don't want to get into a mess between the two superpowers. But the U.S. said, OK, this guy's a problem. We're going to conspire in his overthrow. And the U.S. played a role in uh, the revolution. Uh, of February uh, 2014. A lot of U.S. money went into the overthrow of Yanukovych. And the day that the right wing stormed uh, the government buildings, the U.S. said, we recognize the new government. It didn't say, wait a minute, that's extra constitutional. That's a power grab. Uh, we have to bring Yanukovych safely back to Ukraine. It didn't say anything like that. In a nanosecond, it recognized the new government. That's how the U.S. participates in coups. So uh, that, what did they think? They thought they would get away with it. Well, uh, President Putin took back Crimea. Hmm, that's not good. Uh, and uh, then uh, Russia cleverly uh, helped to negotiate the Minsk II agreement, which was endorsed by the UN Security Council, which called for a diplomatic resolution for the r ethnic Russian uh, regions of eastern Ukraine, Lugansk and Donetsk. Uh, but then the United States said, we don't have to go along with Russia. 
Putin. No way. We'll just blow that off, even though we voted for it in the Security Council. That's a bluff again. But they didn't get away with it because Putin said, no, you can't just ignore what you have voted. And he put on the table a security agreement in December 2021 for negotiation with the U.S. I said at the time, negotiate, avoid a larger war. What President Putin's proposing is perfectly sensible. It ends NATO enlargement. It stops unilateral placement of intermediate range missiles in Europe. It does many things. Stop. The White House told me, no, 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 we can do what we want because the delusion continued. So that was kind of a bluff. We don't think that that uh, Putin will carry on. Then came the special military operation. Then they bluffed again or, or they thought, well, our sanctions will be enough to prevail. You know, we'll crush Russia by uh, uh, by uh, pushing Russian banks out of the SWIFT uh, clearing system, by putting in HIMARS and ATACMS and other wonder weapons and so forth. So when you ask, is it a bluff or is it real? It's kind of both. They are playing poker. They're lousy players, by the way. Uh, they don't understand anything about the game. They don't understand that the other side can have a good hand. They don't understand that for the other side, it's uh, it can't be a matter of bluff. They're not ready to listen to the other side. They don't want to discuss with the other side. Uh, they think that negotiation is weakness, which is one of the stupidest ideas on our planet, because they don't even understand uh, what the Russian position is, I feel. Uh, or they're so dumb that they think that they can either bluff or scare or defeat Russia, none of which is possible. So the answer is it. they do play poker very badly. Uh, and the U.S. Uh, keeps losing uh, war after war, hand after hand. U.S. power is uh, waning. We are in a multipolar world, but uh, the U.S. doesn't relent. It keeps raising the stakes. It's absolutely uncanny. Uh, it's a terrible way to play poker, and it's endangering all of us because, frankly, those stakes are mine, <laughs> not just the people playing them. They're my life, uh, my family's life, uh, my uh, tax dollars, uh, uh, many things. And I resent how badly they play the, their hand. Mm. Wow. Okay. So um, so they tried uh, re uh, the regime change in uh, Russia. That didn't work out. In, in Ukraine and actually and in Russia, of course. Yeah. <laughs> but yes. And then uh, they're doing some really... Uh, but crazy things in uh, the Middle East. I cannot even understand what their uh, uh, final objective is. Uh, but we know that they uh, would definitely want to uh, but contain China, uh, to defeat China. What is their plan? I mean, it seems so ridiculous. Uh, for yeah. example, I was uh, reading this article about uh, the U.S., uh, uh, the weapons manufacturers, and they all depend on uh, on uh, Chinese products, <laughs> you know, like <laughs> Raytheon and Lockheed Martin and all these people, they cannot make a missile without uh, Chinese uh, components. So what is yes. their, so what is their uh, final strategy with uh, China? And uh, will there uh, like ever be uh, wisdom, you know, uh, some wise people in the blob to try to secure a new, uh, framework with uh, China and Russia? I can tell you, uh, looking back, uh, the, the, the blob never understood China's rise. Uh, and as early as I've been involved in this issue, uh, from the 1990s onward actively, they thought China was a bubble. China's economy would burst. Uh, this is a myth. The myth of the East Asian miracle. Many things were said. So they never took seriously China's rise uh, and didn't understand it. And then it suddenly dawned on them. I, I put it to the year 2014, which was a, a year that uh, China did two things. One, uh, China uh, uh, announced the Belt and Road Initiative uh, around that moment. And China announced the Made in China 2025 policy to uh, really push forward on key uh, cutting edge technologies. Then the U.S. freaked out. And you can read uh, very interesting documents that basically say, oh, my God, now we have to contain China. 
well, a little naive for a country of 300 uh, 35 million to contain a country of 1.4 billion when the country of 1.4 billion has twice the manufacturing capacity as the country of 335 million people and an overall economy measured at international prices that is probably 25% smaller, 30% smaller. In other words, the U.S. can't contain China, but it's trying to do so. It's trying to do so militarily. It's trying to do so because it believes that it can keep the technological edge by restricting the flow of advanced microchips to China and so forth. All of this, to my mind, again, is mean-spirited, delusional, confrontational when we should be cooperative. China's not a threat to the United States. It's not a threat to the world. It's just a country catching up for lost time uh, after a, a long history especially in the 19th century and first half of the 20th century when it fell way behind because of external, because of wars uh, of invasion in China, civil war, the Taiping Rebellion, many things went wrong in China for 150 years. China's making up for lost time very well, but it's not a threat to the U.S. It's not a threat to anybody. Uh, we should be applauding China's progress but uh, the U.S. policymakers see China as a, an affront and a threat to U.S. hegemony, which is a delusional idea, but still there. So they're trying to contain China. It won't work, but it's extremely dangerous. And these idiotic generals of ours are talking about a war over Taiwan. And God forbid, first of all. And second, <laughs> they're not going to win that war, a, a war 60 miles off the coast of China with a great power that has an existential fight compared to the U.S., which is like in Ukraine, but even more, a, a, a war of choice that makes no sense for the U.S., and which the U.S. public would never support. So the whole thing is, again, wrongheaded and dangerous. What should the U.S. do? It should be friends with China and with Russia, by the way. There's absolutely no reason for these fundamental conflicts. There mm. are no reasons. This is not some fight to the finish. Russia doesn't threaten the United States, except if we're in conflict. But we don't need to be in conflict. That's a self-fulfilling prophecy if we say we don't care what Russia says. If we listen to Russia and Russia said, leave some space between your military and ours so that Ukraine can be neutral, we should say, great idea. Thanks, God. Let's just take care. Let's be prudent. And none of this would have happened.